A uh, couple of questions to start with. Uh, mm -hmm. How many of you were here in November and December? Okay, we have 20 hands. Okay. Regarding uh, certificates, how many of you can claim to enjoy doing that? <laughs> I have one, two, three people who are even inveterate liars. <laughs> or you have tooling which I sim sincerely hope could even outshine this. Let's see how it goes. The idea is that anyone else who's been dealing with this knows that it's a pain in the, well, backside. And Geneva Convention, one of the core rules is that you are not supposed to treat prisoners of war with disrespect. And if you end up using TLS for da on a daily basis, or even a, on a weekly basis, you feel like you've been just thrown in a really hot sand pit. That's how it feels usually. So we have a way to make it slightly less painful, even enjoyable. Right, well, uh, what anyone would like to call me, just pick a term. I'm also responding to, hey, you. Yeah. So first of all, who we are. And in this case, I think I even have my notes. Yeah, I do. So uh, first of all, we have 80-ish people, 50, nearly 50 engineers as of, as of yesterday. The count sort of changes from month to month. Uh, we enable gambling. So we're not a bookie. We run a betting exchange. Easiest way to think about it is that we are gambling meets fintech. So we have the gambling regulations and customer base who are entitled as anything, but we take the fintech approach. So if it's code, it works. If it takes people, we try to use less of that. People are expensive, code is cheaper. Even in something like, like gambling, which is usually high margin, we are doing our best to sort of carve that out as well. Uh, one of the problems we have is that the reputation for industry and gambling in particular is 60 years of gouging customers after it was basically made everywhere, every activity in, in UK, leaves the customers sort of expecting that at any given time a gambling outfit could just shut down and run away with customer funds. Most re recent one to do that was 66666 bet, I think less than two years ago. And it happens every now and then. So what we did to sort of appease our regulators, we went with the idea that we have what the, with the, the TLS is everywhere we use. So it gives us certain, certain bonuses, also quite a bit of problems, which we work around. But mostly it is there to sort of appease the regulators, because as far as I know, we are still the only one regulated under Maltese Gambling Authority to get approval to run everything in the cloud. And as a company, we go with the idea that if you build it, you run it and you own it. So we go with DevOps culture as a proper culture, not just as technology. So what's going to happen over the next few mi minutes? 15 or so. Background why we did this. I started there. What was good? What was bad? Also, how to build your own CA? Things that come with it, things that you really like, like about it, and things you really don't want to see with it. The bit about tooling, how we did that, and the things we learned or hoped we had learned or even known before we started. And at the end, or at the end of the show, you can ask me anything. I, I'm going through FQA. I'm going to question your answers. You're all people who know monitoring, right? If you look at that kind of graph, what comes to your mind? <laughs> yeah. Usually, if you're, if you're into DevOps and you see a graph like that, you would be either calling the fire brigade gate or your mother. Because usually that means problems. That is, in fact, our u online user count on Boxing Day. That, that happens to be Christmas Day when it's basically flat. And then in four hours, it goes from zero to high numbers. So everything we do is there to handle spikes like that, peaks like that and spikes which are even worse than that. We have double that spike during Cheltenham. So, you get, you get an idea. 
Now, when I asked about the who, who were here last year, my original idea was to talk about logging, but it would have been pretty boring. We had November and December all about logging, and to be honest, it would have been also a pretty short talk. I expect you to call me on this afterwards. We did that. So the real presentation starts now. How do we make sure that we can run CLS everywhere and what do we get from it? First of all, the thing you really want in fintech is in you care about integrity. Money is everything. We hold on to other people's money in an industry where we happen to be an uphill against uphill battle in a really, let's be, let's be honest, shitty reputational industry overall. So we care about corruption. Bitflips would be disastrous. It's bad enough to have your cash corrupt. It would be even worse to have your database corrupt where you actually hold financial data. So that helps a bit. Uh, it allows us to make sure that communication happens securely. The best approach so far, which is nobody's friend, is client certificates. So you have that. You can assure that the clients you are con communicating, mutual communication happens. They check each other. Okay, that's, that's kosher. That's valid. And then at least you let as soon as as long as any nobody has popped your CA, you can sort of. Uh, assume that it's okay. It gives us transport security. It prevents casual dumping. Even if you happen to get access to Snoop to a Snoop port in a switch in our data center, you would see garbage. And of course, regulator demands it. And with certificates comes expiration. The joy and pay of the entire thing. How many of you have had to deal with certs that expire unexpectedly? Oh, we have honesty. I'm impressed. More than 10. Wonderful. Uh, how many of you had those happen for your perimeter and outward facing site? A couple of others. How many of you had your internal critical service do that? 50-50 split. Both? And we have two people who actually have had the pain of that as well. So what, what happens is that when you get an expiration of certificate, the failure mode is really ugly. The clients just fail. You end up having something which worked an hour before just starts breaking in a really weird way. If it's connection to your service, you get, what is this? It's just getting errors back. If it happens to be your database, what just went wrong? And what this means is that it, you only see regularly that verify failed. You go. Okay, so I know this worked uh, yesterday. Why is it breaking? Oh. So the best thing that this, this gives you is that you really learn to log every single error with verbosity. You end up actually checking what went wrong and not just something went wrong. And as a really good bonus, uh, it actually encourages you to dump your host as soon as possible. Go with something which, where the hosts themselves are transient, but services keep on running. So. I can see people nodding to the concept of immutability. I'm a fan of that as well. Now, as I said, it teaches things. First of all, it teaches everyone to really feel the pain of databases. So if you run any database and which you don't reboot on a regular basis, you're, you will have customers, in other words, your engineering teams, who will depend on having persistent connections working at all times. It's okay, it's database, it's rock solid. Postgres is one of the most robust pieces of software I have seen in my life. It's right there with HA proxy. You can throw anything at it and it will just survive, as long as you don't end up deleting the wall files or otherwise corrupting its indices. Been there, done, that got the scars. So it also means that the engineers who end up using connections which can last for days, weeks or months, they assume that database is always there, which I specify I that it's hubris of highest order. So what you want to do is get rid of this kind of horrible concept that it just works. So what it does give you with expiration, either you have connections dying due to cert, cert going out of date, or you need to reboot service every time you, need to, you reissue a certificate. Either way, eventually, the teams will learn not to trust databases. 
or at least the connections. We're not there yet everywhere, but we're getting a bit better. As in, I think these days, recovery time from database reboot is roughly six seconds of, of retries, and then it's back up, back up. But how we did this? Few of you mentioned that, or claim to be happy about using TLS. So now the question is, how good are you really? As in, it, di it did some work. We need some, some assembly required, of course. So it, it doesn't come out of the box. How, how we build one? We start with pulling in Cloudflare. They have a wonderful tool called CFSSL. Who has see any, any, ever using, used this? I have half a dozen, maybe. Okay, good. So if you feel to inject, how do you like the tool? Meh, okay. Why it's only, why meh? Because Acme does it for me. So. Okay, fair point. You still need to automate the body thing. If, I, if I'm building Kubernetes, is it? Yeah. Because it's PKI also. Yeah. It's yep. As in, and if anyone asks why we're not using the Amazon's provided certificates inside our systems, it's because when we started building the setup, <laughs> Amazon certificate service was not yet live. It, I don't think it's, it was even in private beta. So we had to go with what was available. But how to build a CA properly? There are two things. Everything in, in your infrastructure depends on the CA once you have a TLS enabled everywhere. So your CI pipeline depends on it, your deployment depends on it, your community, and everything assumes that you have CA in place. So when you need to boost up a cluster, you need to have a way to build your CA up first before you have CI in place at all. That's the reason why this is self-contained. So we have rules to make it possible to just bring up another CA, get it up there, provision key, put keys in there, and have it running. I think from zero to, to running that running, it's probably something to the order of four or five minutes these days. It's not bad, but it could be better. It also means that the CA certificate is available easily everywhere, plus the tools which you use to build them. So you know you're using all, always the same binaries. What you want to do, you want to, of course, check something in your tooling. And also, Having an a web server which doesn't actually even understand CGI is really handy. You just get the CA file and you can get the binaries and that's it. And the final command in here, this is actually how we issue a certificate. So we specify, okay, this, these are the names you want to give them. Have a look at this one. So it's a list of host names which go through and we give it's a rule set of defaults and then this is there just to make it easier, because the default tooling drop, drops out a JSON blob, so you need to strip the damn thing. That is sort of a cleaned up version of our CSR the JSON. What I, what I said about here, overriding host names, it's here. So we have host name, which is, of course, not valid for anything. So we override that entirely. And the rest is just, well, boilerplate, pretty much. So with that setup, it takes roughly two seconds to issue a search. And the architecture we have looks pretty much like this. We have the CA host, which is locked down and has nothing on it except the web server and the actual CA interface. That's all. It's locked down because the damn thing needs to have a CA private key. Yeah. What we then do, somewhere from either a bastion host or from a secure office, we issue certs and then we deploy the damn things across the fleet on the host anytime a new host is brought up. Whether it's running Snowflake host software or random containers, logic is same. Files go out on the, on the host and with trivial modifications you can actually make it run also with Kubernetes easily because the only difference in the certificates with Kubernetes is that in, with K8 you need to have the certificate valid for the IP address nakedly. You can't have the DNS name alone there because Kub Kubernetes just uh, ignores it. It just goes next to the IP address straight away. In which regard, it's a bit like Amazon's ELB, which I'll get to later. The tooling we used. So we're an Ansible shop. That is what it takes. One line, one role. You run that. It issues a certificate, uploads it in place, puts permissions as, as you want it. There are keywords available where we need to boost up and sometimes break cycles, where you need to have, effectively, you need to know from the future which paths 
needs to exist for a given user, which doesn't exist for a new host yet. But if you have a host with no special needs, that'll work. If we want to reissue, it needs manual intervention, and that's by design. I don't want to get in the habit of issuing certificates all the time on hosts, so I prefer to have a host cycle out of existence before they expire. So these are only needed for long-running services which have not been transferred into proper immutable systems yet. And you can specify one, you can specify ten, you can issue 40 of them at the same time, it gets roughly the same, same time in any case. Two seconds per search, done. So we are literally in a state where it takes longer to configure a service to use the TLS than it takes to actually issue the certificates on the host and the service itself. And the last bullet point is there again by design. Engineers who need to connect to production, they need client certificates, and anytime we issue those, we don't want that to be trivially easy. So it actually, it is a manual step. So it involves going through a short, painful trip to our office. Okay, I need this to be able to go there. It basically makes it, it encourages not to connect to production unless you really need it. And the only people who really do are basically marketing and our fraud detection team. But that was a good thing. Now the, for the bad and the ugly. Number one is that if you run TLS everywhere, you cannot, and I can't stress this enough, you cannot use a fully fledged web server as your terminator. Reason being that as Amazon's ELB connects to the host with IP only. When you connect with an IP over HTTPS to a host, a compliant web server comes back with 301 and tells you, I'd like you to connect to this location instead. ELB firstly treats 301 as not 200, which is obviously it's correct, it's logically solid. But it doesn't follow the redirection either. So you end up having a situation where if you go with a robust TLS terminator, you end up having a situation where you can't use health check in e with ELB, at least in HTTPS mode. That's the really ugly part. So either you hack around it and you expose the health check over HTTP endpoint, or you go with something which is less compliant and actually allows to ignore the damn checks and doesn't do the en entire round trip of please try again with your host name set correctly. So anything which is a real framework, even a micro framework will do. I haven't found a way to make any web service do this nicely. Another problem is that the CAU issue is a global wildcard. It is valid for star. Which means that in order to connect to your production, you need to have the CA valid in all your engineers and all your employees' workstations. Otherwise you get errors. That means that anyone managing to hijack your CA key could effectively spearfish your entire company to oblivion because everything they issue with that key would be valid. <coughs> there is a specification in X509 called name constraints. How many of you have actually ever tried to use that? Good. It doesn't work. It's possible to build a, a search request where you can give this particular OID manually. If you have that kind of request, OpenSSL will actually croak with bio read error and Go's crypto TLS will just panic. So I haven't seen a single stack in the world which actually would honor this thing. Meaning that if you actually have a certificate which even send, has that and you pr send that to a client, most of the clients will crash as well. Or at least treat it as an invalid certificate, sorry. So, what we have is that the best practice in the world is actually not possible. Yeah, that's the really big pain point. And having TLS everywhere also means that either you have to revoke the damn things when something breaks, or something you assume can be popped or has leaked, or has been compromised, or you go with the pain of having everything be really short term, which again is kind of painful, but going for short term is slightly easier from an engineering point of view, trying to manage your own CRL, because the replication checklists are a single point of failure, and effectively you end up dealing with, with caching, caching validation in your production for everything. 
And that's one of the two unsolved problems. As the recap, so what we did, as in TLS doesn't need to be difficult. It's annoying, but it's doable. And you can work around the problems by just using proper tooling. Uh, as long as you can make it transparent so it, nobody has to think about it, it'll just work. Expiration on certificates actually can encourage better engineering practices because things can fail and you don't end up depending on long-running services, at least on present connections. So eventually it helps against database abuse or it, people end up assuming database is always there. So it's really good for immutable infrastructure. Just go for it. Jesus cattle, you have services behind load balancers. Load balancers themselves may have longer running or long, certificates with values for longer periods of time. Actual services make them as short as you possibly can. The thing which we haven't yet solved nicely is when the CA eventually expires, as in a root certificate, that needs to be handled gracefully. And because we have to deal with some long running clients, the the process of changing CA has to start at least two years before the deadline itself looms. So you have to have cross-signing in your infrastructure in place. And if anyone was going to ask why we, we use RSA, because it would be nice to use ECC curves instead. The sad fact is that when you run a mixed infrastructure with multiple different clients and multiple different ages, you cannot rely on them understanding ECC properly or you can't rely on them actually linking to open SSL libraries which would support ECC correctly. Yeah. I name one early version of Erlang at least here. But, and a final bonus, if you end up using CFSSL, it, it beats the pants off of OpenSSL for generating certificate requests. The only downside in that is that you need the JSON file available, and when you issue a certificate, it doesn't come with CN specified at all. So there is no canonical name for the certificate. You only get uh, extension for DNS entries, which is actually makes sense for Cloudflare, who wrote the tool, because they have certificates which are valid for 20 or 30 hosts. And in fact, the RFC for TLS, I believe from 20, 20, 709 onwards, deprecates CN in any case. So you're not supposed to rely on that. Server name on it. SNI is everywhere, so you have, in any case, systems where you actually terminate connections for dozen or two dozen services on a single entry. So you need to have wildcards, and if you have a wildcard, you are locked down, so it makes sense to have everything in the, in the DNS fields instead, and see it just being empty. And final slide. Yeah, we're hiring. If you want to read more, go to, see our blog. And the engineering principles can be literally condensed in those two word, sentences. We don't break ex user experience, and we don't break engineering workflow. Everything else is fair game. And if you want to talk more, I'll be available either with a can of soda or with a bottle of beer in my hand in about an hour, I believe. Mm -hmm.